So back in the days when I was going commando everywhere, and once I approached the Pizza Hut and I go to the register to go pick up my order, there was a family waiting to my right, by the way. Uh, I noticed that the guy at the register was just kind of frozen in place, like, oh, uh, uh, and he's like, hey, man, uh, your fly's down. And I was just like, oh, okay. And then when I reached down to look, my junk was out. That entire family to my right had just seen my genitalia. Needless to say, I needed to make some changes in my life, and that's where Sheath comes in. Sheath underwear now protects me from legal ramifications of walking around with my genitals out. I never have to worry about going to jail for indecent exposure with the protection of sheath underwear. If you don't know, sheath underwear come with a little pouch in the front where you can put your boys in it, and it gives you extra support. It's really good for combat sports. It's really good for running, and it's really good for avoiding the police. Go to sheathunderwear.com, use the promo code RRBG, and save some money and support your boys. They need you. Also, avoid prison time. While he's getting ready, shout out to Thunder King Coffee. Shout out to Saints Joints. Shout out to El Yucateco Hot Sauce. Shout out to Sheath Underwear. Shout out to Liquid Death Water. And shout out to everybody on Patreon. Thank you for helping me. During these times, you guys are all yep. awesome. Yeah, a lot of sponsors. Dude, it's nuts. I gotta. I don't know how to say no. <laughs> it's not a bad thing though. What, yeah. Uh, how do you like your L? Was it you El Yucateca? I think that's what it is. El Yucateco hot sauce, man. They're awesome. Yeah. They're uh, they've been around for like fifty years, you know. And, and I used to use it all the time, and in uh, especially in in Florida and Homestead, there's a Mexican restaurant called Rosita's, and they mm-hmm. had it. They had one at every table. It was awesome. There's a spot in Huntington Beach called Secret Spot, and I remember Rogan talked about El Yucateca, and I tried it down there, and I remember, I think I tried the green sauce. It's mm, yeah, fucking so hot. <laughs> yeah, it's super spicy, man, and they're not fucking around. <laughs> yeah, they're not, not fucking around in the slightest bit. Yeah, man. So, uh, welcome everyone to the RRBG. I'm here with Chris Hornbrook, drummer extraordinaire. How are you, brother? I'm good, man. I feel, feel a little, uh, slept a little shitty last night, but uh, I feel good. So if I'm searching for words, that's why. But I should be I, fine. I'm with you, man. I woke up with a stiff neck. I guess I passed out like on the side or something. And now it's just, I've been rubbing CBD on there and trying to like yeah. make it feel better. But man, it's as you yeah. get older, you can't, it's like, I don't, I can't like do one false move. Then I wake up feeling like shit, you know? Yeah, you got to be careful, man. I, I, one hundred percent on the same page. I, I have to sleep with a with a single soft pillow, but I have two pillows. So if I don't in the night, if I just don't remove the other pillow, I sleep on an elevation, and that just kind of fucks my head up. And that's kind of what I did last night. Ah man, I bought this so, crazy pillow that has like shapes. It's like mm-hmm. um, it has elevated on the sides but not the neck and then it's got like a an area for you to put your arms if you sleep on your on your stomach yeah, yeah. and and uh it, it was good for like the first couple months but now i'm back to like waking up with stiff neck if i don't position myself properly it's really annoying yeah man i, I it's yeah as you get older and your body adjusts to the bed and the pillow that you sleep on if you don't keep it consistent it'll just fuck your whole day up yeah, man. Which is, kind of, which is kind of nuts. But <laughs> part, it's part of getting old, man. Yeah. Old. Yeah, part of getting old. Especially, like, it's got to be extra tough for a drummer. Like, you got extra limbs that you're using that, you know, other people don't really yeah. would normally use on a regular basis. And yeah. if you don't keep those kind of moving, you start getting, it's like rust. You know what I mean? You start rusting yeah. out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, have to, I definitely have to be very careful. But for the most part, I'm I'm very cautious about what I do and how I sleep and you know, stretching out before I play, stretching out before I play shows, even before I like go to my studio and rehearse, you know, I'm I'm doing, I'm stretching out, doing this sort of shit to make sure all this stuff is, you know, good and good to go. My girlfriend, she's really good at giving massages. So for some reason, this area, you know, gets all whatever tight. She'll go in and she'll do like a deep rub and like massage out all of the knots and all the bullshit. And I just have to be careful not to overwork it because I have a I have really mild tendon. I believe it's tendonitis, but I, I'm not quite sure, to be honest. But I believe I have tendonitis, like a very, very mild. And if I, if I go too deep, if I play too long or hit too hard, I'll feel like a bit of a flare up that happens here. But I don't know because all this stuff is connected, you know? 
Yeah. I don't know if it is because I'm not supporting like another muscle somewhere. And yeah. It's just it. I, 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 she, she was kind of telling me about that and it made sense. And I noticed the more I was stretching, the better results I would have with like non flare ups. So, you know, I bounce around the shit. I was highly focused on that maybe about four or five months ago. And then, you know, stretch, it went away. Stop thinking about it. <laughs> right, 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 right. Yeah. Yeah. It's crazy then, how that all works, man. Yeah, all this shit's connected, and just as we get older, because I'm gonna be I'm gonna be 40 in April. So as I get older, it's kind of like I have to make sure that you know I'm eating well and I'm getting good sleep and I'm having a good amount of exercise because you hit your 40s, your testosterone starts to start to take a shit. So yeah, I try to generate as much natural testosterone as I can, but I'm not a, I'm not I'm not against getting on any sort of TRT, you know. If I have to down the road, if it, if it starts to be noticeable, for sure, man. Yeah, I'm I'm turning forty in November, and uh, same thing. I'm I'm still fine. I still feel great and energetic, yeah. and you know, sex drive is up, thank God, and uh, yeah. all that stuff. But yeah, I've heard after forty, it's like it's like a downhill uh, from there. But I'm I'm all about HGH and TRT. I ain't you know I'm not a professional MMA fighter. I don't give a fuck. I don't need to worry about USADA or any of that shit. So yeah. Juice me up, baby. Let's yeah, that's, that's, that's kind of my attitude, especially when I hit my 50s and 60s and it becomes noticeable. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I'm going to take it natural as long as I can take it. But then once it starts to become noticeable, I'll definitely go to a doctor and make the necessary moves. But, you know, working out, lifting weights, that'll help. Having a young lifestyle, yeah. eating well, you know, not doing too many drugs and drinking too much and just like... You do all the stuff to kind of keep you going. I think for the most part, you'll be fine. But I mean, at some point, it, it will catch up to all of us. It's unavoidable. Oh, yeah. My thing is like, let me take it as far as I can go before it's time to get off the train. Yeah, no, I hear you. And I've been doing a lot of that, too, with the especially with beer. Like I, you know, you know me from back in the day. I used to drink every day and it was, you know, mm-hmm. I'd hang out with Jeff and we'd get blackout drunk and say, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. I don't, I don't do that anymore. I haven't had a blackout situation. I haven't, you know, I, I have maybe like on my weekends, I'll have a couple beers, mm-hmm. one or two. And then, yeah. and that's cause I'm just chilling cause I don't have anything to do that day. Um, yeah. but after, like, aside from that, I don't really go on drinking like I used to. And, uh, it's made a big difference. It made a big difference. I lost a lot of weight. I've, I feel more, I feel stronger. I feel more agile. I don't know. Yeah. yeah, man. All those extra calories. Yeah. Extra calories and, you know, doing dumb stuff that you do when you get drunk, you start moshing with your friends and, yeah. <laughs> um, but you know, things, things have been, I think, uh, relatively health wise good. Uh, considering that there's a virus trying to kill everyone outside. Yeah, uh, that's uh. that's kind of the big thing. It seems to be attacking the most vulnerable, the extremely old, or people that oh. have uh, unhealthy lifestyles. It's really, it's really a, it's really a shame. But I hope that people kind of get the get the fucking the wake up call that it's time to kind of get your shit straight. Like, you know, the obesity and and just guard because you know America gives you what you want. They don't give you what you need. Right. And uh, what we want over time kills us. Mm-hmm. So if we don't really take ownership over the fact that like we need to dial things down and focus on the things that are going to be healthy for us, then you know that's that's what's going to save us from things like COVID and you know all all whatever else is down the pipeline. Because I don't think this is going to be the last time that we're going to see something like COVID. Oh, no, absolutely not. I'm going to keep going. And, uh, you know, it's weird because sometimes I want to blame the education system. I'll be like, hey, man, no one told me this stuff, you know. But I know that there are health classes and things that do get taught to you as you grow. You just ignore it because you're young and stupid, you know. And and I think the point is to get to get to a point in your life and an age in your life where you stop the the, the, you know, the eating Doritos every day and fucking Mountain Dew and all that shit like that's fine when you're like a little kid and you, you know, a teenager, you don't have to really worry about it all that much because your body's still growing and stuff. But, <clears throat> but as an adult, you can't do that shit. You can't be. No. And also too, you don't appreciate it after a while. Cause like to eat like pleasurable things that, you know, Doritos or ice cream or whatever, or have a beer every once in a while or eat a, eat a pizza. If you just do it all the time, 
yeah, you feel like shit, but then if you sort of break it up and you eat well, and then you do have those moments where you do indulge, it's, uh, it's, it's almost like it's extra fulfilling. Yeah. You know what I mean? Whereas if you have something all the time, you get used to it. It becomes your normality. It's what you consume all the time. And then with the, also the fact that it doesn't make you feel good. You just feel like shit. I mean, I go through periods where I eat like trash and I feel sluggish. I start to gain weight. I can see it in my skin. I can see, like my energy level sucks. Um, man, carbs, man, they're really addictive and they're really, uh, they take, they're designed to taste fucking incredible. So you just want to fucking keep eating them The fucking, yeah, the Doritos, the fucking Cheetos thing of cookies. Like you just consume. Cause it's just like, it's designed to, to stimulate do that. that part of you. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's just designed to do that. So it's like, but yeah, it's like dialing it back and dialing the alcohol back, dialing the food back and just really trying to take care of yourself, getting your bo- your body in order. Like you can get like, yeah, yeah, you're younger, you can get away with all that shit, but now as adults, like we we can't. It's like that that window is closing. And I see it for me, it's closing. It's like if I'm trying to preserve what I have or even make it better as I get older, if I can, you know, if it's possible to even do that, I, I you, know, you kind of have to do it late 30s, early 40s. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, especially you, you're you're active as hell with the drums, man. You haven't stopped. I mean, I know that yep. a lot of musicians during this time have been, you know, not really working as hard or working, but, you know, since they're not on the road every day, it's not that same grind. You know, they're still working, they're yeah. still writing, you know, whatever, but it's not that mm-hmm. grind. And you, you no, stayed active. Different. I tried, you know, I tried as much as I could to stay as active as I could. It's, it's difficult, obviously, because zero shows, zero concerts. Um, it's just people putting out records, and there's a lot of people that are trying to wait out the pandemic before they put out a record. Mm-hmm. Because you do that, you kill your cycle. But also, yeah. too, you hold on to this record for a year or two, then you're not as excited about the record. Yeah. So it's a bit of a tricky, delicate balance. And uh, fortunately, with working with, uh, with Greg, Greg Pichotto, he was just like, fuck it, I'm not going to hold on my record. I'm going to release, you know, I think he dropped the first single in February or it was right before the pandemic. So he dropped the first single in February and then the pandemic hit. And I don't know what if his plan was to release all the singles that he did leading up to the release of the record. The way it worked out, he just every month or two, you know, new single here, new single there, new single there. And uh, it was cool, you know, because you know, being on work and on singles even before the record came out, you know, that's just added things that he's pushing through his, uh, his record label federal, federal prisoner. Yeah. But it, I was really fortunate because we tracked that record last year, like, uh, September, October of last year, we did all the drums and he spent X amount of time doing all his stuff. And then, um, yeah, it's just kind of like, it worked out to where I was, I was, I was active during the bulk of the pandemic in different ways, whether it's doing, you know, doing his live stream, or yet yeah, being on the singles or the record or like him and I shot a music video in the middle of the summer. It's just different bits of, of pieces just to keep yourself out there and uh, keep as active as you can. Yeah. Yeah, man. Um, I wanted to ask you, cause I mean, just from like an outsider's perspective, looking in, um, mm-hmm. it seemed like the Greg album featured a lot of different guests and like, you know, I know it had Chris sure. Penny on a track and, um, mm-hmm. Was it was it always the plan for you to be kind of like hear more often or be like the drummer uh, as opposed to just being a guest spot on the on the record? Yeah, when he originally approached approached me about it, he was like, "I have a bulk of songs, and I think that your playing would work well for them." And he kind of explained to me what he wanted to do, and uh, initially he had thrown out like he said, "I you know I want Chris to be on a song." Because I guess that was like kind of a, you know, a, a relationship that he wanted to sort of, you know, um, rekindle. Right, right. And um, it was initially supposed to be just Chris and I. And then kind of the way things sort of panned out, I was busy during the time that he needed a song track. Poison the Well was doing, we we're doing that show at the El Rey at the beginning of the year, beginning of 2020. Uh-huh. And it just so happens, I know he was working on the Kill or Be Killed record. And he just said, had Ben track a song. I think this is the song Roaches. So Ben Kohler played on one song. And then I played on 
initially I played on nine songs, but over the time, a few of them, a few of the arrange, arrangements got reworked. Like um, there's a song called uh, Fireflies. That was a completely different song. It kind of had like a, I don't want to say like an, like a West, it was a rock song, but it had a little bit of like a Western feel to it. Wasn't wasn't jabbing with him, so he kind of went the complete other direction and kind of took it more towards like a Gary Newman direction, you know. And if, okay. there was a few other songs that kind of got sliced up and like he sort of reworked. So at the end of the day, I ended up playing on six songs with a few other songs having little bits of pieces that from the initial sessions that we did. And like I said, Chris was supposed, Chris Penny was supposed to play one song. He ended up playing on two songs. A bunch of the other songs, uh, him and Nick Rowe, the producer, they, you know, they program, programmed out the drums because they're kind of more electronic pop feel to them. Mm -hmm. So the initial plan was to have me on a majority of the songs, but just the kind of way it worked out, it whittled down a bit. But I think Greg, in his mind, because he kind of wants to keep it as I'm sort of seeing it now and kind of getting the feel, he wants to keep it more like, 90s vibe like heavy 90s vibe and i think from what he's sort of told me that that's kind of like my feel and my pocket really works for that sort of thing so you know plus two yeah. it's like the chemistry is there like between him and i like i know what he likes he knows what i like you know he throws me songs that he thinks i'll do well on and it's it's a really good uh there's good uh there's a good working relationship between him and i yeah, and I mean, and you guys have known each other for a long time. I know that yeah. you know, you know, I know the boys in the well and Dillinger, and, you know, toured together and all that. So, and you, yeah. I, I, good chemistry comes when you're with friends and stuff like that too. You get to meet, you get to know someone. You can get that cool connection that musicians get where we uh, telepathically communicate. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, it's good. It's it's cool. Him and I, uh, I, I mean, him and I spoke a while about doing stuff. And about seven, eight years ago, when his other band, the Black Queen, started getting going, I was originally kind of part of the early incarnation of it when it was more of an instrumental thing. And then I guess kind of how, you know, things sort of took the direction that they took. It went full electronic pop and they didn't have drums at all. But there's a few songs that I played on in a studio session we did in the beginning. And then when they actually did the record itself, the bits and pieces of stuff that I played. And then there's other drummer, Jeff Friedel, who plays in uh, a perfect circle and he used to play in Pussifer and, and Devo. And, you know, he's kind of playing with those bands. We both did two different sessions and uh, uh, Steve Ryan or Asian Steve as we, as his nickname is. Yeah. Uh, he was like, Oh yeah, we would just take, I took shit from Jeff and took shit from you. And we just cut it up and we just did all this sort of weird stuff. So that first record, I technically didn't play anything on it. It was more just like they took weird loops and stuff like that and weird shit in the background that's happening or would cut up like little drum fills and sort of do that sort of thing. But um, I, forget where I, was. I actually completely forget where I was going. Oh, uh, Greg and I talking about doing stuff. I was a part of that initially. And yeah. then it just, you know, diverged, but it was fine. I kept doing my thing and he kept doing his. And then, yeah, I guess he was telling me that the hole in which he had written his solo stuff was uh, initially where I guess he would kind of do a Dillinger record. And since they're kind of no more, he just started writing stuff and it's like, Hey, it's not fitting with killer be killed. And it's not fitting with black queen. Okay. Maybe I should do something else. And initially it wasn't his, under his, his name. It was, I think he was going to call a child soldier. Mm. And then eventually I guess he had a, like, he was saying that he had a conversation with Jerry Cantrell and, because he was, he's been working with Jerry, and Jerry's like, "Oh, you should just do it under your name." So I guess it took him a moment to like sort of get used to that. But I think at the end of the day, it's great. I mean, you know, he wants to do cool shit, and this is a good outlet for him to do whatever he feels like doing. Yeah. So it's not, know, it could, sounds like a mix of all of the things he's been a part of too. You know, like for the for the most part, yeah. It's a, it's a it's a full like it's a full circle of all his stuff, and he just kind of grabbed his friends, his drummer friends that he's worked with that he thought would work really well for whatever particular songs that they, they he thought that their skill set would work. And I think, yeah, I think he picked wisely. All the stuff Chris played was really good. The song that Ben played on was really good. Yeah. You know, I feel confident and, you know, feel good about the stuff that I played on. So, yeah, it's a great record. I'm really proud to be a part of it. I think that it will be a record that people 
care about down the road. You know, I don't think it's just kind of flash in the pan. I think, I think it'll be, uh, I think it'll be something that people will look back and be like, that was a really cool, interesting record, especially these days. I don't feel like people are doing really, really interesting stuff anymore. People are playing it really safe and, or they're stuck in like, this is what people expect of our band. So this is what we're doing. I like, the, I kind of like the unexpected from bands and, and artists and stuff like that. And just, I don't know, just, I don't really feel like I'm getting that anymore. Yeah, I mean, there's stuff out there. You just, it's, it's harder to. How can I explain it? Like, you have to work for it. You have to go look for it because otherwise, you're not getting it presented to you, unless you have a very diverse Spotify playlist. You know, where they yeah. hook you up with the the Discover playlist shit. But um, yeah. it's there's not a lot of access, I guess. Like before, you know, like when Poison the Well started, you guys. We're in a time where music videos were still getting put on TV, you know, and that kind of mm-hmm. stuff. So that's not really happening care. anymore. Yeah, people cared. Like now it's it's all on YouTube and there's so much that people just kind of like, eh, you know, if it comes, it comes. If not, I'm not really going to, I'm not really going to put too much work into looking into it. Like I, thankfully, because of the podcast, I get hundreds of emails every day and even that's becoming too much. Like I'm just, yeah. God, it's like a sea of fans that keep coming out and it's hard to keep track of all of them. But there's some stuff. There's stuff here in LA that I, I mean, this this group uh, clipping, the hip hop group that, man, I've never heard anything like that. I'll tell you. I don't know if you've yeah. heard them, but it's no, it's like, in, not it's, like a, it's like industrial. It's like Nine Inch Nails, but with really intelligent rap over it. It's just mm-hmm. I don't even, and I've never heard anything like quite like that. Uh, there's other groups like uh, Igor from I think Sweden or France, and the comments are gonna piss me off or gonna get pissed at me because. I mentioned them last time and everybody was like, they're from here. And I already forgot. Sorry, guys. I guess <laughs> French or I don't know. Who cares? But they're great. Yeah. That's, that's what matters. Yeah. Uh, they, cause they, they, they combine stuff. They make unique fusions of things. Like it's, it's, you got uh corpse grinder from cannibal corpse screaming on a song and it's a death metal song. And then it turns into like a Nintendo song and then it switches to like uh opera. There's a lady yeah. singing opera and there's violins and, and it turns yeah. into drum and bass, and I'm just like, okay, that's I'm, that's what I I would enjoy uh, because I have such a w- w- wide array of you know things that I enjoy. So I like it when bands put all that stuff together. Mm-hmm. I think that's what Greg did with this record. Like you hear a song, it sounds like a Black Queen song ish, you know, like it has that vibe. Yeah. And then there's another song that just it's heavy and fast, kind of Dillinger ish, and you know, it's cool. I like it. The the whole thing, like you were saying, that bands get locked into their little formula kind of it gets uh it gets boring and it gets um it makes you lose respect a little bit when you're like hey eh, you're doing the same thing over and over <laughs> yeah you know? well i get it i i understand to a certain degree like the, the the bigger bands and the bigger artists because at that point then their livelihood that's it, true. it becomes a, it becomes a factor like certain bands can't diverge because if they diverge then they lose their fans and if they have a family and if they have children and if they have responsibilities, then that becomes jeopardized. Yeah. So they become l- way less risk averse because of that. So I get it. I, I, I totally do get it. I just think that in that case, some of some bands like that should really like fully try to, if they're going to do their formula and do their thing, like really push the boundaries of that as much as they can. But, much like anything else, man, if you've been doing something for a really long time, you become a little complacent, you become a little bit comfortable with things. And to really shake things up, you have to be in a group of people that want that, or you yourself have to push, or you you know hire a producer, or some yeah. sort of outside source that's going to push you in a direction that maybe you wouldn't have gone before. But, you know, I, 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 I obviously, I'm not going to speak to what they do and why they do it. I'm just really kind of concerned with myself with just involving myself with like bands and artists that are um somewhat like i don't say prolific but like that want to do very interesting stuff and push the envelope in their own ways and do good tasteful stuff really yeah and you've done that man i mean aside from poison the well and you know not even talking about the ba- that band's personal growth which you know you were saying diverting can affect you know your livelihood like that kind of happened with Poison the Well, sort of, where like you guys started getting more experimental and a little more, uh, you know, opening up and evolving the sound of the band. And a lot of the older fans are like, "Oh, it's not, you know, 
not yeah, this anymore. Yeah. It's like, oh, fuck off. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah, you know, yeah. it's it's one of those things you can't really please everybody. So you have to like, you have to please yourself and the people that you're creating uh, music with first and foremost. Yeah. I mean, we definitely shot ourselves in the foot in terms of like being able to create a long term sustainable band that, you know, we could do today and could be really, really big and can make a lot of money. But on the flip side, I think that we created like a really cool long term musical legacy within like our world. So kind of sacrificed one for the other. I mean, preferably for myself, I would have liked for those two things to coexist. But I, I don't even know if that's possible. Nor well, I mean, you, you, you guys definitely have a thing now where people are excited that you guys are playing shows every once in a while. That's because you know, we don't play that often. Yeah, people are like, yeah. "Oh shit, they're playing this. Let's go!" Like, I have friends that are calling me, like, "I'm flying in for this perform." I'm like, "Oh, okay." Yeah. Like, all right. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, I, yeah. I mean, we've. Uh, it's the idea that you know, if you sort of retract the amount that you put out there, when you do put it out there, people are going to be expi- ex- uh, excited, especially if you have, you know, a respected sort of musical legacy. Yeah. Yeah, and and you know, going back to what I was saying before, I got, went on a poison the well tangent. But like you know, you mm. did poison the well. Uh, you you have played with senses fail, right? And you you did, mm-hmm. um, you know, you're doing the Greg thing. You did work with Danny Harrison, who's a you know the yeah. son of Beetle. Is like that's a huge kind of a huge thing. Like it's he's cool. got a, yeah, he's, I mean, yeah, yeah it's, it, all that's all this stuff was cool and fun to varying degrees, you know. Um, playing with Danny was really great. You know, I still kind of do play with him. Just when he chooses to do something, you know, he gives me a call. If I'm available, then I'll do it. You know, I, I love working with him. He's a really great guy. And he is very excited and wants to do very fun stuff. And he assembled a really great band. There's fantastic chemistry between everybody. And, you know, I, I really do throw, I, I really do genuinely uh, enjoy playing with him. But he doesn't do stuff all that often because he doesn't have to. And he has other things that he does that that take up his time and attention so i mean hopefully the next time it comes around and he's uh he's gonna do something that uh that he gives me a call you know did you have any uh like writing involvement in any of the music or was it all him and you just you know you're just learning them and, and playing them? came on board after he had recorded his record so i think he took a few years to kind of fully flesh out what he wanted to do and um, when he was ready to kind of start gearing up to do promo for it, um, late 2017, yeah, late 2017, uh, he, he, yeah, he, his manager reached out to me and said that he was interested. Uh, he had saw me play with Big Black Delta, and he thought that I would be good for that. And, you know, him and I have, uh, had interacted a bit before that, but... Um, but yeah, I'm just kind of geared up and we just started with one festival and it just kind of snowballed after that. And uh, he just appreciated the uh, the chemistry and we had fun on tour and it was great. So yeah, it was that was that was just kind of it. That's kind of how it got going. He just, like I said, hopefully hopefully next time something happens, you know, he hits me up. That'd be awesome to do. Nice. Man. Uh, how about you mentioned Big Black Delta? Are they, you know, I know he put out music 2020. Yeah. Are, are you still working with him are you planning like you know obviously now nobody's doing shows but like if eventually there's shows is that something you're still working with him on it's the same thing you know uh, john and i uh because john 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 bates is big black delta he does he does everything uh studio wise um it, yeah i mean i'm still involved with him okay you know, him and i him and i are still we're still pals we're still buddies and he just doesn't really play too much I think he's focused on a lot with like writing music and that sort of thing. So, you know, when he wants to play shows, you know, once again, at the doors, the, the door is always open with him and I. So, you know, if he wants to hit me up then cool, hit me up and, you know, we work something out, we figure it out. If he wants to play a few shows or just play an LA show or tour or whatever. Like I, I typically don't close a lot of doors with bands and artists that I, that I work with typically, you know? So, yeah, him and I, I mean, he's great. He's a great dude, and he writes really cool music. So, I mean, like I said, I kind of just, I want to be involved with people that are that are world-class at what they do and uh, that I can always have fun and I can always enjoy myself, and it's somewhat challenging in different ways. 
that's man you know i i respect that because that's how i see life and i and it's i feel yeah. like it's so important that people do that and not a lot of people do that a lot of people close themselves off to a specific group of people that they hang out with or you yeah. know a, a specific type of thing like i'm a gamer so anything i do and everything i do is that or i'm a you know i'm a metal head so everything's metal it's like closing yourself off to some really great stuff well, people have a tendency of just being tribal. That's kind of how we are. That's how we've evolved. So I, I understand. I understand uh, those tendencies in which people like gravitate towards that. So yeah. but I, I personally, and like they have to say, you know, I have my circle of friends and my extended circle and my family, and like you know, I, I do have those tendencies too. But as the older I get, the more that I realize that the more that you close yourself off, the more you just don't you don't maximize life. You don't get everything you want out of life, you know, whether it's romantic relationships or your interpersonal relationships with your friends or just experiences in general. And it's super, super, super unfulfilling. I mean, I'm sure anybody watching this podcast, maybe even yourself, the, the pandemic has kind of closed everybody off. And uh, it's not a good feeling, man. Yeah. It's not a good feeling not being able to see the people you care about or you know, not being able to see your grandparents or see your, your family cause you, or your parents because they're older or you can't go to a restaurant and sit down and eat or whatever, you know, like you definitely feel that weight when it's not there. It's, it's really, uh, it's really, really clear, you know, so not that the pandemic has emphasized that I've always kind of known that, but it really drove the point home. It, it drove multiple po- points home for me, but that was one. It's like, man, when I really... Yeah, I just really miss just being able to go sit down at a restaurant and eat or like meet up with my friends and have a drink somewhere, or, like meet up for dinner or like whatever, you know, just anything. Go see a movie, go to a show like uh, and I obviously I know I'm not alone. So, you know, having yeah. that connectivity with people, your friends who you care about and all that whole fucking thing. I, I don't think I, I at least for a year or so, once things sort of resume after the pandemic, I think people are going to be really grateful. Yeah, I would hope so. I would hope the people are grateful and that we, uh, you know, appreciate the things we were taking for granted for sure. Does that mean yeah. even myself, I've fallen victim to that. Like I'd try and do a lot. You know, I, I used to go to shows yeah. all the time. Yeah. You know, we've run into each other at shows. Yeah. Um, but it gets to a point where sometimes it was, it got to a point where sometimes I would get, you know, uh, text messages like, Hey man, I'm, I'm in town or I'm playing. And it's like, I, you know, I'm exhausted. I'm staying in. Like now, I'm looking back and I'm like, I should have fucking gone. I, you know what I mean? Like, I, you know what I mean? Like you, now it's yeah. gone. Now, I'm, now I didn't go to that show, and now who knows when the next fucking show is, or the next hangout, or the next, you know, get together or whatever it may be. You know, yeah. people, you gotta, people. T- hmm? Yeah, I was even saying you got to take shit when it's there. Yeah, That's people take advantage always- of that. Yeah, people don't people don't really realize that sometimes one day something will present itself and the next day it'll be completely gone because we live in such an overabundance of society of of resources and things to do and people especially in California, especially in Southern California, you know, there's no shortage of typically when things aren't crazy, there's no shortage of anything. You can go at any point, you can see a movie, you can go to a concert, you can go to an art event, you can go to the beach, you can go to the mountains, you can go to the fucking desert. You could hang out with endless amounts of people, the, the whole nine, you know. So it just got to take shit when it when it presents itself. And I and I hope that I know in the long term people will forget because people kind of want to go back to their habits. But I at least hope that there'll be a, a group of people once things sort of settle down and get back to somewhat of a normality that realize like, hey man, I can't take this for granted. Yeah. And, you know, it's not just the pandemic holding us back, all this other stuff that's going on. I'm not going to get into it. There, I mean, yeah. it, it's like I want to talk about it because it's such a thing, but I also don't because there's so much of it out there. But there is a, a lot of shit going on outside in the political yeah. world and, and in D.C. that aside from the virus, that's just it's draining. You know, it's really draining. Like I've definitely yeah. felt in the last couple months a struggle with my mental health with it. Like I'll, you know, when, when the whole thing was going down on the 6th of January, I, you know, I wasn't, I was working, but like my friends were messaging me stuff about it and I'm looking at it and I felt like a physical 
tension just start gripping my entire skull and my neck. And then my yeah. brain started spiraling. I couldn't even read what I was doing mm -hmm. at work. I was like, what the fuck is this? You know, like, yeah. and it's nuts. It's nuts. So I hope that all of this shit, like the, the lesson is supposed to be you work, you go through some shit to grow and, and, and become a better person. You know, you, these experiences will make you a better, stronger person. So I'm yeah. hoping that that's what happens and we don't end up kind of just reverting. You know what I mean? Well, I I hope, but the reality is, it's not. It's going to get worse, and it it gets. It's going to get worse, not just from like a political point of view. I mean, obviously, right now, you know, Democrats are controlling everything. So how they proceed forward and the policies that they put forth are going to dictate, you know, the next four years of our lives. But they're also it's also going to sort of dictate when they're up for you know when their seats are up for you know reelection or whatever. But more so, it's going to get worse because people, mainly like news, the news capitalizes off of fear. Mm -hmm. And that is, that's, I mean, politics aside, I feel like that's what the real problem is. is it, it comes from the news and how the news is given to us and how it's, you know, salacious titles and, you know, it's, it's everything is, is very fear-based. So my whole thing is I've learned to sort of uh, engage and interact with the news at a distance and also to like watch multiple outlets, center, mm -hmm. left and right to got to get an idea because the world that we live in, it's just it's we're, we're living in echo chambers. And, mm -hmm. you know, I might have my reality of how I consume news and, and how much news I consume, but yet my neighbor could be completely glued to either Fox or CNN or these other outlets and her or his reality is completely different. And that's a huge problem because the news is there to sort of report objectively what's going on. But that's not what it is because objectively what's going on doesn't get people to click or watch. Yeah. It becomes about money at the end of the day. And it's like sacrificing everybody's nerves, everybody's mental health, for money. It's really what it is. This is really how I see it. And I don't want to have anything to do with that sort of system. I get my news. I'll go online. Like I said, I'll bounce around and I won't get too deep into it. I'll be very, as soon as I start feeling like any sort of like anxiety or anything like that, I, I usually retract. I usually will I'll pull back. And uh, I, I just, I've just, to have a really fulfilling life. This is kind of not that these are new and, you know, my ideas or anything like that, but I've kind of cobbled together uh, to have a fulfilling life. You minimal interaction with the news, no interaction with pop culture that completely remove pop culture from your life. And this is something that I'm sure everybody struggles with the social media. Dial back your social media consumption considerably. And this is something that I struggle with because it's like as a musician, you know, I use primarily I use like Instagram. Not really. I don't really fuck with Facebook at all. I don't really a little bit of Twitter, but nothing crazy. But as a musician, you know, you you go on Instagram and that that's where people our age are congregating and, and posting stuff. So it's like being addicted to it. It's just, you know, the, the, the more that I kind of look at it the more it's just not serving me and especially too as they change the algorithms and they incrementally change all this stuff to the point where it's like i find myself falling into the trap or like i'll post something and once one thing will get great engagement and it'll feel really good and then i'll post something else the next day and it'll get low engagement and then i feel bad yep but it's yep. not because it genuinely went out there and people were either into it or not into it there was an algorithm feeding it to people so at that, that point, that with me, then it, and I'm sure I'm, like I said, I'm not alone because it plays on human psychology. Then you start competing with yourself or then you start questioning yourself and it elicits these really dark negative emotions. And that doesn't, that's, that's one of my, I mean, that's a, definitely a goal that I have is to dial that shit back. It's like, use it for music, post on it. Don't get too attached with the end result. Because it's it's there's no organic growth on it anymore if you're a musician. There's none. Yeah. I would have to like get hired by a really big band and then that band starts posting on their social media 
like on, on Instagram. And then from there, those, those sorts of people start following me. But me putting myself out there, unless I figure out a way to hack the algorithm and like curate what I do to ride the, the wave of whatever's popular, which I'm not interested in. I'm, I don't want to, I don't want to do that. Like I want to put myself out there as what I present to the world in my musical sphere, you know, my musical world. And if it doesn't suit somebody, I don't want to curate it. I don't like the idea of content content's garbage. I don't, the influencer, like all that stuff is just really, really devoid of any fucking substance, man. I want to be involved with things that have substance to them and put those things out and have people that are interested in what I do musically are interested in me and not because I'm playing with this band or not because I post this sort of like picture or whatever, you know? Yeah. Be involved with meaningful things. But back to my, 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 the, the, the point I was trying to make is that you really just have to cut out all the garbage from your life yeah. because this is, this is just, there's tons of manipulation happening for somebody else's benefit or some other organization's benefit and not yours it's to your detriment and a lot of people have fallen kind of into the trap and uh it's not it's not it's not easy to fall like once you're in it's not easy because it's a bait and switch instagram is 100 as an example it's a bait 100 a bait and switch mm-hmm. when everybody got on instagram however many years ago it was one way and over time they've just incrementally just kept changing it changing it and like well they got bought out by facebook (laughs) yeah and like we all obviously you know i don't think history is going to look kindly back on facebook no i don't think so either and the the mine how unethical the mining of all the taking everybody's data and selling it off and and like that's really it's ugly man it's really fucking ugly that's the issue with me like I, i hear a lot of people these days especially uh talking about how social media platforms are trying to destroy democracy and destroy the First Amendment, the freedom of speech, because they're censoring people. It's like, that's not even a concern to me, because I am fully aware of what a user agreement is and what a terms of service is. So I know that if you break the rules, they're going to cancel your account. It's not some fucking communist plot. Uh, but, but, But concerns me is that algorithm, that thing. That thing is, it's, that is it, a problem. Well, the algorithm is a problem, problem, but to speaking kind of to what you were just saying, it's what's the problem is that we're congregating in private space mm-hmm. online. And these companies are companies and they're private companies. And some are going to make ethical decisions and some aren't. And maybe what they deem ethical is something that you don't deem ethical. Maybe they, I, they, uh, identify with a particular ideology that maybe have some radical views in either direction who knows mm-hmm. but the problem is is that we're not congregating in public spaces anymore we're congregating in private spaces and, and until the government steps in and makes the distinction whether they're um what is it a a publisher or what's the other term or a platform the distinction you know it's like you know people talk on the phone and I think that is just simply like the fuck, it's like the concept of a publisher. Like the phone isn't responsible if you make a drug deal over the phone or if you they're just right. providing a service. Whereas a long time, the longest time, that's what these social media companies were doing. But since 2016, it's been very noticeable that they're censoring people that are on the right because their particular ideology doesn't align with that. Yeah, you know. And then people on the right are freaking out, but it's like it's. Technically, at this point, they're a private company, but at the same time, it's but then on the on the left, it's like, well, you know, it's it's difficult because they're they're uh, they're private company, you know, and it's like it's the user agreement. It's the user agreement. And I keep I had this argument with my father yesterday because he was like, oh, you know, they're censoring the everyone on the right. I'm like, yes, but Um, everyone on the right also clicked agree on that contract. That gives that company permission to shut you down on their platform. That's it. Yeah. I'm not right. taking their side. I'm not saying that that's the way to do it. I'm just saying you agreed. <laughs> like, yeah. If you, the well, second it, you sign up your account, you're fucked. You can't yeah, complain, no, man. You're, dude, you're, you're, I mean, you're totally right. You agree to those terms. And like I said, it's not a, it's not a public square mm-hmm. where you can meet. 
it's a private it's a it's a private location like you can't oh. go in you can't go into home depot and start fucking screaming shit and doing crazy know, kick stuff your ass because up. it's a <laughs> private place like if they like hey you have to if you're going to enter our store these days and you you have to wear a mask regardless right. if you agree that masks do this or that that's as a private place they have every right as a private business they have every right to say that is part of it just like no shoes no service Right. Same fucking same fucking thing too, you know. Like whether you agree with it or not, it's kind of irrelevant. It's like their business, and that's what they require. Who cares? Put on the mask or whatever, you know. But the, the well, the to speak to what you're talking about, but then the problem is now is that since the fact that like a lot of these tech platforms are predominantly left and they're purging people that are on the right, what's going to happen is that there are going to be social media companies that come up that are on the right. Well, oh, it's gonna, it's gonna create, yeah, it's gonna create even more echo chambers, mm-hmm. and it's mm-hmm. gonna split things even more. Which is the is really the crux of the problem is that two the two sides are not communicating. Whether it's political, whether like the yin and the yang, I guess is they're not they're not synergistically working together anymore. We're they're, we're split, and part of the thing I was talking to you about before with removing all the garbage with the news and stuff like that. Is because that is splitting people. Mm-hmm. That's splitting people down the middle, middle for profit, for their own gain, at the sacrifice of every normal fucking person out here. Like I don't want to look at my neighbor. I'm I'm a, I'm a centrist. I'm a, I'm an independent, and I'm in the middle. But I don't want to look at my neighbor that's on the left and think that there's a divide between her and I, or him and I. Or I don't want to look to somebody on the right and feel like that there's a divide between her and I, or him and I. I like to say, hey. You believe this, I believe that. You have some debates, discussions. Maybe they some say, say some stuff that make you think. Maybe you say some stuff that make them think, whatever. But at the end of the day, we're all Americans. We all need to work together for a common goal. Because when you're split, nothing gets done. Everything just fucking falls apart, and that's what's happening. And that, going even further, back to what we were talking about before, that's why I'm not cynical. I'm realistic that like things aren't going to get better. And everybody needs to take ownership and responsibilities over themselves. The individual responsibility of even if it's not your fault, even if you didn't fucking do the thing or do this, or do that or whatever. It's like the concept of just taking extreme ownership because if you don't handle the thing that's in your life, whether you did it or not, that doesn't mean it's still not going to be there and it, it potentially can't get worse. Yeah. And yeah. as soon as people just own that, as soon as people are just kind of like, I'm moving this fucking garbage and I'm handling my personal business, whether it's your emotional, your finances, your whatever, whatever is in disarray in your fucking life, the sooner that you get to doing that, the sooner that you will have a fulfilling life. And the world could be burning around you, but if you have an exit strategy and you have your shit together, you'll be fine. Yeah. I mean, I think that's probably an idea to think about um, with how to fix the situation. Because if we can convince people that social media platforms like IG and Facebook, which we all use, I use for the promotion of the show. And like you were saying earlier, like sometimes I'll put an episode out and there's a thousand views in an hour. And then I'll put another episode out with like what I think is a big guest. And then it's like, not at all. There's nothing there, you know? And it, it, that means somebody is controlling my shit. So, We would need to figure out how to get rid of that. How to convince people that those social media platforms are junk food. You know what I mean? There's no way, man. I mean, uh, look. Like I said, I, like I said, there's no way you're gonna do that. There's, there is. It's addictive. It's yeah. like cigarettes. You know, people knew for a long time that cigarettes give you cancer and kill you. People, some people just don't have the will. Yeah, they don't. They'll still, still smoke. My dad's one of them. My dad's been smoking since he was 12, and he's 60. I think he's 66. Mm. And, you know, he knows the implications of smoking, but he just can't quit for whatever his reasons are. And there's millions of properties. (laughs) Yeah, all the addictive properties. But you translate that to social media, all the addictive psychological properties that are pulling you in. I feel it too, man. I have a lot of control. I'm very, I'm a a pretty disciplined guy. I have my shit together. And even me, I kind of just, I feel the compulsion to pick up my phone. And, you know, if I want to, um, really get a hold of it 
I'm going to have to make some serious commitments to myself, but it's not fucking easy yeah. at all, especially as being a musician and as like a platform like Instagram being uh, geared toward what I do and what I build and as a means of promotion for myself. But man, I'm not, I, I am this, the whole pandemic has really highlighted for me that Politicians don't care. Left, yeah. right, they don't care. If if you noticed what was happening leading up to the election, it was it was people needed fucking help, really fucking help, and all those fucking assholes could do was just worry about who was going to get the White House and then yeah. blame the other side. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's, all, That's it all it was. It was personal gain. There was like, there's a fire I, over there, but we're busy with this right here. We'll get to that fire later. It's like you're all I, gonna burn <laughs> dude, at the expense of fucking millions of people. Yeah, like people really needed help. Uh, and and then and then when they eventually do pass something, you're gonna you're gonna fucking give people like a six hundred dollar stimulus. It's just like, it's just kind of like insane. Mm-hmm. It's it's completely it's completely insane, and it just highlighted for me that like. The people that got bailed out and, and it were these huge companies that got the PPP loans and all this sort of like help. And then the average person, especially in California, because everything's closed here, they didn't get anything. Yep. They, didn't, they didn't get shit. And it, it's, just, it's just completely fucking nuts to me. But not to go off on a tangent, but it's like they don't care. And if you think that politicians are going to do anything to make your life better, dude, I got 50 bridges to sell you. Because they don't. They care about themselves. They care about maintaining their power. And at least now with the Democrats being in office, there will be help. But the problem is, is that it's going to come at the expense of the long term with inflation. They're going to dump. They're dumping trillions of dollars, man. Like that is not going to be good in the long term for the dollar yeah. at all. So it's, it's, fixing, it's fixing the problem now at the expense of the future. And that's not good either. So politicians don't fucking care. They don't care at all. These monolithic companies, they don't care. They just want your attention, your time, your money, whatever resource you can give them. They don't give a fuck at all. The only people that really give a fuck about you is, you know, yourself. Yourself, your family, your brothers, your sisters, your, 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 you know, your significant other, your close friends. And then obviously in me saying this, this is not fuck over other people because I'm very much a golden rule guy. You do right by the world, man. Like if you don't want somebody doing something to you, you do that and you honor that shit to yourself. You know, you don't say, well, you know, ah, fuck this guy, whatever, blah, 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 and like fuck him over. Like, no, that's not because if that was reversed, you'd be fucking pissed and you'd be hurt. But the only only person that is going to save you is yourself. And politicians aren't going to do it. These companies aren't going to do it. No to you everything everything is on your fucking shoulders to change if you want your if you are not help ha- happy with your situation easier said than done but it it it, it has to be done mm-hmm. really what it boils down to man i like i talk to my mom sometimes and she's you know she's she's a democrat she's like oh you know biden's gonna fix things and i keep telling her i was like mom i was like you're putting your faith in the wrong thing like if you yeah. are unhappy with something you need to fix it you need to fix it. it, whether it means not engaging with news that much, wh- whatever you need to do, whatever you need to remove and insert good stuff into your life. Yeah, it's really, been, it's, it's, it's really what it boils down to, man. Yeah, I've been grateful, I guess you can say hashtag blessed uh, <laughs> or whatever. But, you know, the, the struggles that I've gone through in life have shaped me to think that way, you know, being... Yeah. Being in a in a in a family that was constantly in trouble with the law and and you know moving from city to city from state to state and then like you know once I broke away from the family on my own with like mm-hmm. basically zero education like trying to just figure shit out yeah you 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 go through the motions and you learn things one of the things that I learned most importantly was karma like I'm not a, I'm not a religious person in any way or spiritual mm-hmm. I'm I guess I'm spiritual but <clears throat> yeah, but but karma is one of those things that I learned the hard way, and yeah. I now approach everything in my life with that in mind. Because 
you know, I used to be a piece of shit. And then that's because that's, you know, like I said, my family was a crime family. So I get to, that was, to me, yeah. that was the normal. So, yeah. you know, going into a store and like pick, you know, just swiping a couple things in my pocket or, you know, I've done this shit when I was young, when I was a kid, I would, you know, if I saw a package in the mail that looked interesting, I'd fucking take it if there was no one there. Yeah. And all yeah. that terrible, terrible behavior all came back to me. I got everything just piled on kind of like a mm -hmm. like a dump truck like here's all the bullshit you did right back yeah. at you buddy i've got yeah. my house broken into and they stole every single thing i had i've had car accidents that have put me in a, in a state of of death uh you know i I've, I've gone to you know i did some time like there's just you learn the hard way i, I had to learn the hard way but now every time i i, I, I approach life i'm like well i'm gonna do it in a good way so that good yeah. comes back Otherwise, if I do bullshit, I'm going to get bullshit back. That's it. Yeah. Real, real yeah, simple. It's super simple. But yeah, like in your case, you didn't learn that growing up. No. Like, I had to I, find I, out the hard way. <laughs> yeah. I learned. My parents taught me that. But then there's other things they didn't teach me that I had to learn the hard way as well, man. Like, it's just kind of the way it goes. But yeah, I, I'm on board with you, man. Treat people the way you want to be treated. You go, it's all the golden rule. It's all boils down to the golden rule. And have cooperative relationships with people not manipulative not not don't be duplicitous like have cooperative relationships where you know if you are working with somebody you know and i, I don't mean so much like you know a significant other a family but you know you in, in business situations and people try to manipulate and shit like that it's just like you know engage in a situation where like everything's on the table and both parties are benefiting mm -hmm. and everybody will be happy not hard. Yep, I agree. Not hard at all, man. And 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 going, I wanted to like the thought in my head was like, how do we, how do we, uh, can there be a way to fix the the control that the social media programs are basically dictating people's lives? Yeah, I mean that's their entire life is their social media presence, and and you know, and since we see that it is a addictive thing, and some people just can't get away from it, like cigarettes and whatnot. Uh, yeah. What kind of help can be provided to get people to disengage while not losing, like not cold turkey? You know what I mean? <clears throat> and it would be creating some kind of platform for people that isn't manipulated. That, mm -hmm. you know, it's a genuine kind of a free thing that like, you know, they say like parlor was one of those things, but not like that. And and in you you would think in my brain, my brain automatically goes to maybe it needs to be government controlled. And then it's like, nope. Can't really have the government controlling that. Yeah. But like, but having it be treated like a public space, like how you were saying that, you know, these private companies, where where can we go that is a actual public space yeah. that that people can go congregate in and then not have their shit manipulated? And I don't know. You know, it. it you would have. Can we to, do? <laughs> you would have to have somebody that creates a company or people that create a company that really wholeheartedly believe in that idea and that that is the allure of that particular platform is that this is a public space but the, the issue with that is that when you congregate in that public space or that virtual you know quote unquote public space you're gonna obviously you're gonna attract a lot of people in the middle but then you're gonna attract a lot of people on either end of the spectrum of crazy you know crazy political, crazy this, crazy that, crazy whatever. And that becomes a difficult thing because then you, you, you attract the crazy right, then you get like the ethno-national people that nobody likes. And then, you know, on the left, then you get the, the people that like, I don't even want to go into that because that's all shit, shit's nutty. But like you get into the cancel culture people over here on the left, it's like, you, you can't win, you know? It's like, it's like people being possessed by two crazy religious groups so not that i don't think that that stuff would a platform like that would work but you'd be dealing with a lot of stuff you know there'd definitely be a lot of postings and a lot of i mean depending upon how it is right is it is it a is it a picture platform is it like text like, it's like twitter like what is what is it you know I don't know. So I like the I like the old difficult. concept. I like the old concept of uh, back in the day. I remember in, in college, I had my own website where you know yeah. I, I would build it myself, and it was like it was like really shitty back in the day. Like I was using this program called Hippie, and we would like 
I had little animated torches, so it looked like a castle, and you know mm-hmm. that. But uh, yeah, it's all cheesy. But like that's kind of the idea. Maybe a reversion back to the going and everyone having their own website, and like that's the place to go. Because nowadays, when people want to find, like, if I wanted to find out about a band, I don't even go to their website. I go to their IG or their, you know, I go to a social media platform to see what they got going on. And then if they have nobody, a website, nobody cares about websites. Exactly. I think that may be. What has to happen is a reversion back to people caring about websites, but I don't well, know. I, I'll, take I, I don't it even, know. I'll take I'll take Eddie. I'll even take it a step further. I'd like to take it even further back to like pre-social media. I think that's the best way: face-to-face interactions with people. Oh well, of course. I mean that that's the goal. But I think, especially these days, with the virus keeping everybody at home and the lockdown and six feet distance. Everything is moving in the direction of like, well, we can't be face to face as much anymore. So now we have this is our option: these Zoom calls, these Skype calls. This, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, and, yeah, and yeah, yeah. There has to be something in that space that can bring us together. Otherwise, the only other option is a complete separation. You know what I mean? Yeah. It, 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 we can't be united anymore. Like, there has to be well, you guys over there, you guys over there. Go for well, it. No, no. <laughs> I, I get that. I, I guess I'm I'm speaking once the vaccine's distributed, once herd herd immunity is 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 we we reached that. Once there's a, some sort of a semblance of normality oh. again, that's what I mean. I, obviously now this is what we have to do, and I totally get it. But I mean, like once things are opened up again, like I'm not interested in interacting with people on social media, man. I want to get together with them in real life and like face to face and have conversations and just like. I, I think going back to how we deal with stuff and how we evolved is probably going to bring us the most satisfaction across multiple avenues in our life, like health wise, uh, like, you know, nutritional health, mental health, like just overall happiness, man. I, I think the closer that the, the further we get away from this like new bullshit and we, the closer we get to, how we evolved and like that stuff that's like baked into our DNA, the more fulfilling of a life that we'll have. And that's like, I think that's ultimately like my long-term goal is to, is to be more engaged with that than engage with where things are going because there's, there's a learning curve and maybe over time. Yeah. We'll evolve if technology keeps growing and we don't destroy ourselves or destroy the planet or whatever, or meteor hits us. Then maybe over time we'll evolve to uh, evolve to sort of communicate and, and be the way that the direction that technology is going. But I mean, that's gonna how many millions of years is that gonna be, or hundreds of thousands of years? However, it takes for us to evolve with our surroundings. Like, I'm not interested in that. My lifespan, if I'm lucky, I'm gonna be 40. My life, my I'm lucky if I'll have another solid 50 years of life. Yeah, forty to fifty uh, years. I'm I not get thirty. In that. Yeah, <laughs> I got, I got dude, thirty. <laughs> I'm, dude, I'm straight up just not interested. I'm not interested in like looking where things are going. In that regard, I just like eat healthy, be healthy, have good health, mental health, have healthy relationships around you, and just all this other stuff that's just fucking seeping in. Yeah. Get rid of it. Fuck the news. Fuck social media. Fuck the politicians. Just honestly, fuck everything that's trying to manipulate you to extract something from you. Yeah. That's it. And I, I, if everybody attempted to sort of implement that into their lives, their lives would become so much more fucking fulfilling. I agree. I agree. So and much, so much more fulfilling. That's why I've been struggling so much with this, uh, the pandemic, just because that my whole life was being around people. I was, that's everything I did. Uh, You know, I was either uh, during my day job, I was in an office with a bunch of friends and working together and, you know, making jokes here or there and then leave work and go hang out, go hang out with friends, go to a show, go to a concert, go to the comedy store, go to, you know what I mean? Go have lunch with someone. Oh yeah. yeah, yeah. And, uh, all that's gone. And you know, I want to be optimistic and say, you know, once the vaccine's out and everybody's like, you know, Hey, we're good that everything's going to go back to normal. But, the realists, like you were saying, like, you know, we were saying that we are like, I still, you mentioned in the beginning, this isn't the first one. It's going to, there's going to be more. And there's, 
Oh. And, and now this is going to be the standard of like, well, there's another virus. Everybody lock down again. Put on your mask. Like, you know, hey, I don't dude, know. The, the picture is even greater than that, Eddie. We've entered into a new order of doing things, but people are conditioned for the old order. People want things to go back to the way they were before. It's not coming back. There's going to be a new normality after this. Just like after 9-11, there was mm-hmm. a new normality after that. And it took however much time for people to realize that. People just want to go back to what's comfortable. And the only way that you excel forward is to be uncomfortable and accept where you're at and to, to pivot into what's happening. And human mm-hmm. beings are not fucking good at pivoting at all, but it's the necessity of having to do that. And we are... 100 percent in a new order and there's not any way of turning back and i don't mean that in terms of some like crazy fucking you know a new world order <laughs> yeah nothing like that i just mean like the way society is the way we interact the way things are it's moving in all directions but like people haven't realized that like i i know this sounds bleak but like things aren't going back to normal yeah. they're not pre-pandemic and post-pandemic are going to look very very fucking different and people want nothing more now than to go back to the way things were before. And they're not. And as soon as you realize it's not, and as soon as you, as soon as the dust settles and you could see how things have changed, what has escalated, what has went away, what has what, then yeah, you could sort of manipulate, not manipulate, you can maneuver through that to have more fulfilling life. But like, I've, I've accepted that, you know, it's conversations that I've had with my girlfriend. She's completely accepted it. And we're both on, you know, a particular train where it's just like, yeah, man, pre and post, it's going to be completely different. we got to see where things settle. But even just a small thing, like I've uh, since the pandemic started, I've heavily gotten into the cryptocurrency space because I just don't trust like what's going on, like with dumping all this money into the economy. That's not going to be good for the dollar in the long term. So how do you hedge against that? Well, you could buy gold and silver. Sure. But cryptocurrency is another avenue because it's a whole emerging technology that even uh, or multiple technologies, but even greater, the philosophy behind it. You have control over your money. Mm -hmm. Banks don't have control over it. The blockchain, like what Bitcoin is, blockchain. I could send you Bitcoin and I don't have to fucking use an intermediate between us. I remove that 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 claw, that control. That's that's one way that it's like, okay, that's cryptocurrency is going to be it's going to be the future. And, you know, not even just simply getting on board because of the financial gains that you make, but the philosophical, man. It's just all about having control. Like, look what the banks did in 2008. They got bailed out. What did they do to the Main Street? Fuck you, Main Street. Like, they don't give a fuck about Main Street. You know, my dad dad lost his entire life because of the 2008 fucking collapse. That's not to say that he wasn't complicit in some way. It always takes two sides. You know, there's some ownership on his side. But, you know, the the complete extraction and decimation of the middle class. I mean, that's what that's what say something like Bitcoin is and all these other cryptocurrencies. It's it's a response to the banks. We want control over our money. Why do you have control over it? Why do I put my fucking money in your bank and I have to pay you a monthly fee when you're fucking pooling it together and making more money off it? It's. It's fucking crazy when you think about it. It's yeah. absolutely nuts. So for me, man, I'm not that I'm going 100% into cryptocurrencies. I think I think you definitely need to diversify your portfolio, and you need to be safe and put it in multiple places. But that to me is a perfect example. Like when shit hit the fan in, in March, everything dropped because everybody got freaked out and sold off. So I I bought into a, a bunch of different coins and tokens, and I've been doing really fucking well. And philosophically, it's in line. With, with what I think is right. I think that I should have control over my money. And I don't think banks should. Or they, should, they shouldn't have as much control. What, uh, what kind of program or platform are you using to purchase uh, this bit, you know, the Bitcoin? Stuff? Uh, multiple ones. I mean, Coinbase is the biggest one. Uh, there's Kraken, which is another one I got, I got recently. Uh, I use Crypto.com to buy certain ones that say Coinbase doesn't um, support. Because there's new projects that come up that just don't get really picked up. But from my understanding, at Kraken, which I downloaded recently, it supports uh, some of the coins and tokens that, like, all on the same platform that I'm invested into. So you have, like, the three main blue chip ones, like um, uh, Bitcoin, Ethereum, and Litecoin. 
Mm-hmm. Those are like the main three runners. And then you have other small projects under that are uh, we're considered what they'd be considered like called altcoins. And they're all different projects that are supposed to sort of interlink with what this whole thing is supposed to be. And uh, yeah, I mean, just about, I, I consult a lot with people that I know and I do, I'm, you know, I'm trying to learn more about that space and understand, because I feel like if you're going to invest money in that stuff, you're going to invest into a project. You have to understand how, what that project is and how its relationship works with other things. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, how do you feel about pay, pay, PayPal getting into the game? Because now you can, uh, through your PayPal account, you can buy Bitcoin. Uh, it's, I mean, it makes sense. I mean, all these institutions are going to jump on it. Same thing, Cash App, you could buy uh, and sell Bitcoin on there. You know, you can convert dollars to Bitcoin and Bitcoin dollars. I mean, it's, it's, the natural, it's the natural move. But my thing is that like any coin or token that's supported by a bank immediately, I, I don't fuck with. Um, and then it's inevitable that, you know, these other companies are going to get involved because when there's money to be made, they're going to do it. Right. Uh, I, I, I mean, it doesn't bother me either, either way. I mean, it's it sometimes it is convenient, though, to be able to just say, oh, okay, put some, some of my Bitcoin on here and like convert it into dollars. You know, I want to take a little bit of profit off the top and go buy this or go do that or reinvest it here or do whatever. You know, like it's inevitable. It'll make things more accessible. It'll make it more accessible to like the normal everyday person that wants to buy into it, which is good because now is the time to kind of get it. I mean, the time to really get into it was three or four years ago, but yeah. it's still right now we're like a, there's a bull market happening. It's going to be happening for all of 2021, they project. And if there's a really a time for a normal person to get into <laughs> cryptocurrencies and to start learning about the space, uh, 2021 is because at some point bitcoin will be priced out for the normal person i mean it kind of already is it's sitting anywhere between like 35 to forty thousand dollars per bitcoin right now mm-hmm. but at some point that shit's going to hit even higher because you have these huge institutions that are buying into it and what they're doing is they're inflating shit and then they're doing crazy sales and people freak out and sell and then they keep scooping up more of the bitcoin at some point if you have a bitcoin that's going to be like big dick move you know what i mean yeah so yeah, I, you know, I dropped have, twenty. I dropped twenty bucks in that PayPal <clears throat> through PayPal just to see, you know, how because I I was always I'm I'm like precautious with PayPal because they're a big company. So I was kind of like, like hey. I, don't, I don't like PayPal at all. Yeah. So I was like, yeah, I don't know. But then I just dropped twenty bucks. I'm like, whatever. Here's twenty bucks because they let you yeah. go. At, you can put a dollar. So I put twenty bucks and I checked it yesterday and that was like two weeks ago and it's up to fifty bucks. So I'm like, uh... oh, dude, the gains on cryptocurrency are <laughs> it's they're, like that's what I'm saying. We're in a bull market. Bull market is when things are are going up. Um, we're we're in a bull market this year. And like I said, if there's a time to buy, man, to get in, especially on if you can get on Bitcoin when it falls, that's the thing. But mm-hmm. Ethereum is another really big uh a coin. It's number two behind Bitcoin. That at some point they're projecting that shit to go to. Ten to twenty thousand dollars sometime this year uh, per Ethereum. So you can make a lot of gains, but also too you have to look at you have to be willing to look at your um, portfolio, and it's going to go up in a lot. Like last week, I lost two thousand dollars in my portfolio. I I just it fell. The market fell. They, there was a massive sell off of Bitcoin, and when Bitcoin sells, usually all the other ones kind of follow in suit. Yeah. But it regains like anything else, man, like no pain, no gain. And just understand what you're investing into. Understand the trends of the market. I, you know, I follow a lot of people on YouTube that know more than I do. And, you know, when they talk about emerging projects and how they'll interact with the existing things going on and so on and so forth. It's just, you know, I throw a little bit of money at it and pay attention and the shit goes up. Cool. If it goes down. I'll hold, you know, and I just kind of go along as I, as I, as I'm advised, you know, as I see the trends, because that's all it is. It's trends, you know? Yeah. Well, shit, man, it's been an hour and 15. I got a couple more things for you before we wrap this up, but, uh, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> so musically going back to music and, and away from politics and cryptocurrency, but, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You got anything that you're working on aside from the stuff you've been doing with Greg? I mean, is there another project in the works? Is there more Poison the Well in the works? Um, anything like that? Uh, as of now, Poison the Well has Psycho Vegas 2021, which is in August. Um, that's to me, that's to be determined considering everything that's going on. Could happen, right. could not happen. 
Right. Yeah. Who, who knows? Uh, but that is on the books as of now. Uh, I am in the process of writing with another band that I can't talk too much about, but I'll be writing a record with them and recording in the summer. Okay. And then uh, kind of whatever else comes my way. Things are a little slow right now, but for the most part, I'll, 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 I'll you know, I'll be, I'll be fine. There's enough things cooking in the background that like once it hits, especially too, once things open up and people feel confident about shows and going to shows, then I think things will pick up. Then I'll probably be on a, on a, a few long-term tour cycles and that sort of thing. Cool. Yeah. I definitely, you know, if I got the vaccine in me by psycho, I will be there. You yeah. Know, I, I will definitely like, I'm, I'm not missing any more fucking shows. I'm over that now. Like, yeah. Like, I got to that point where there were so many that I was like, ah, I can miss this one. I'll catch them in the next cycle. It's like, nah, nope. I'm going to everything I can now. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's good. Uh, you know, you, you, I, I'm curious to see what that project is that you're working on. So hopefully, yeah. you know, we'll hear more about that soon. Um, yeah. I'm trying to think. Uh, the, the, the Greg thing, is that something that you want to do live after the pandemic? Is he going to do a tour with that re- record? I can imagine that's probably one of his first priorities is to play shows considering he released that record and, you know, all he's done is a stream, mm. which is cool. And it, it comes across the way he wanted it to come across, but, you know, delivering it in a live format, getting the band together and getting it fucking rock solid and hitting the road. Cause that's also too, that's how we make our money, man. Yeah. You know, so I can imagine that he's going to want to hit the road and it's going to be a, It'll be really good, but I'm guessing. I don't know for certain. Who knows? But I, I'd imagine that that's the thing. That's going to be. That's definitely going to be on the books once things get going again. Um, were there, <clears throat> would you ever do a solo project? That's something that interests you at all. Not really, to be honest, yeah. man. I don't. I don't really care to compete in the market with all these people. I mean, I feel like if I had something that I felt was really worthwhile, that I felt good to put out there and maybe, but until then, like I'll just, I'm down to play drums for people. You know, I do play a bit of guitar and I do write a little bit, like contribute to things. If Greg would be receptive or anybody else I work with would be receptive to me writing with them. That's kind of really all I'm interested in at this point. I like playing drums. I'm not interested in me putting my thing out there. Like I'm not a singer. I'm not a guitar player. Like I'm a drummer and I like, the energy of working with people like when i play on my own like yeah i come up with cool stuff i come up with cool you know melodies on the guitar like cool drum beats and shit like that but i like playing with people where they come from a different angle and i come from another particular angle we put it together and it becomes something really cool and interesting yeah right uh and then it's it's not it's not like i said it's not to say that i wouldn't I just don't, I'm, I'm not that interested, but as you know, as we all know, sometimes you stumble upon things. Yeah. And inspiration it, strikes and you know, something happens. <laughs> yeah. Or, I mean, I would, I would, I would, I wouldn't say venture out solo, but I would definitely be into doing like a duo. Like if it's me and somebody else and it works, but I, I, like I said, I like being creative with people. I don't like being creative by myself because I feel like when I'm creative by myself, it's all co- it, the genesis is all coming from the same creative source, and I kind of know what I deliver, and I I definitely deliver something of value, but it needs something else. So typically, I I kind of know the sorts of people I need to partner up with to make it good, and you know I'm like one half of the whole because obviously drums are a very big thing in a song, so yeah, just just interested in doing and and just working with people and shit like that. Well, since you're saying that, so then. You know, you've you've worked with some great musicians already, but um, mm-hmm. who is somebody that you would like to work with? Uh, maybe on, a, on an album like that, like a duo album, and also just if there was a band that needs a drummer, what band? And and you you pick which band that was. Which band would that be? There'd be a few, man. To be honest, um, for me, I would say. Not the tour, like even just doing a record, I guess doing a record or playing some shows or both. If I would love to work with failure, even though they obviously they have, they have a drummer that, you know, Kelly plays them and he's, 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 he's great for the band, but I'm just saying in an ideal world, 
mm. I would like that because I think my playing style suit would suit that band really well. I would, I would, that would be one band that I would, I would love to, to like, you know, if it, if there's like a, you know, a list of bands, that would be one to be like, even just doing a record with them or doing a tour, that would be like, that would be incredible for me. Um, that Swedish band Cult of Luna. Oh yeah, I dude. Love, yeah, I would love. I, I once again, I think my playing style would fit really well with them. And you know, I know those dudes, and they're really killer dudes. And but I would, I would love, like I said once again, to do like a record or do a tour or do both. And then completely left field, uh, I would love to not so much play live, but I would love to do a, a Dillinger Escape Plan record because it's so far away from how my normal playing is that it would be such a challenge for me. And it really fucking pushed me really hard to to sort of, you know, tap into things that I've learned or learn new things and like really fucking elevate me. Like I think it would push me to the the point, like a, to to a point where like yeah, it would it would it would challenge me beyond anything else. I would love to do a record with them. But like, you know, Billy's their drummer and, and Billy's yeah. my boy. And I'm just saying, like, if there was no friendships if bands and you know didn't have drummers and shit like that. Um, I would like would do that just because it would be so. I mean, I, I like I said, I don't really listen to that music. It's not, it's not my, it's not really not my thing. Like I respect the musicianship. Obviously, I'm friends with some of those dudes, you know, so on and so forth. But it would just be so fucking challenging. Yeah, it would be so challenging, and I think that uh, it would make me a better musician, like without without question. Um, and then yeah, like Queens of the Stone Age. I think I think I would fit yeah. into it. I think I'd I'd fit in really well with Queens, in terms of playing style. Obviously, they have John Theodore. John Theodore's incredible player. You know, great, great, great fit for that band. But that would be a band that I would I would love to just like I said, do a record with, uh, or fucking do do something. You know, just something, just yeah. something that would be like cool. And you have like a fucking you know you have a piece of vinyl of a, a band that you're like this is rad and I contributed to this and I. Did something very, very, very meaningful. And then um, I think that's it for now, to be honest, Ben. Those four bands would be, I'm sure if I kept thinking about it, I could probably come up with another maybe three or four bands. Mm. But that would that's like the main, those are like the main ones that I feel like either suit my playing and would be fun or would be uh, super challenging. Actually, I'll name one more, uh, Candiria. Ooh, I think nice. I, I would do, I would do Candiria. I think my playing style suits it. I would just have to learn a little bit of the language, but I would yeah. love to do, I would love to do that just because I feel like what they do is really interesting, you know? And I, I like their original drummer, Ken, who's a buddy of mine, you know, powerhouse drummer, man. Like it would, I would, I would love just to do it like a record just for myself. But yeah, this is fucking cool. Like bucket list. Like, yeah, man, like this is cool. They did yeah. something, you know? That's awesome. That's a good list. That's a good fucking list. But yeah, uh, that's... It, well, so if you were to pick one person to do a like that duo album, you 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 know theorized. Is there one person that you think you would click best with to write like an album together instead of just you know working with, the, with... with that list list or whomever? Oh, whomever, whomever you want. Like somebody, like somebody is doing a solo record. Doesn't matter who it is. And... Well, you would do it with them. Like not not like you're oh. you're helping a band or you're you know playing with them or like you're gonna write an album with one person who would that yep. be? interesting who would that be oh, man I would have to say fuck man <laughs> that that's it's hard it's hard to like fucking narrow it down um I would. Right now, I'd probably have to say Josh Homme. Nice. Okay. okay. Like, not saying Queens, but just anything. If he was just doing like a rock and roll thing, or or like whatever, because he he's a drummer himself, and he has like a lot of his he has an interesting way of approaching the drums, and uh, I think it would be I think it would be I think, yeah I think it'd be really cool. Hell yeah! Hell yeah! Well, hey man. I appreciate your your time. Um, no worries, man. Thanks for having me. Yeah, man. This was a fun fun uh, conversation. It's good to have you back on the show. I mean, you're one of the yeah. first few when I yeah. first started the show. So it's been yeah, four that's... years doing this shit now. <laughs> it's yeah. It's been it's it's definitely been a minute since I've been on. And uh, yeah, yeah, not to say that like 
I hope everybody that watches this that doesn't think that like I'm some sort of weird cynic or anything like that from all my my sort of views on the way things are going. I'm just I'm a realist, and I think at the end of the day you gotta like you gotta look out for yourself. You know, not at the expense of other people, and obviously helping other people, but you have to kind of put yourself first. Like, uh, like you can't. I, I I maintain the idea that you can't be of service to anybody else until you're service to yourself. Yeah. Yeah. You, know, you have to get your shit in order before you can help other people. Yeah. And you know, I, I uh, yeah. I mean, I hope I'm wrong in a lot of ways. I do think hope. I do think I do hope that things get better, but. My estimation, the way things are moving, I don't think it is. And, you know, just take care of your friends and be a good human being. Exactly, man. And, you know, don't friends and family and be a good human being and don't treat strangers like garbage. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Have some decency. Don't depend on anybody else. Nobody's going to give you anything. Just go get it. Um, Put that work in. I like I said, I'm blessed that I, you know, all the bullshit that I lived through made me that way. Um, mm-hmm. But it's important, I think, for everyone to just think about putting putting your health and your mental health and everything first so that you can help yep. somebody else. Otherwise, you're just going to drown with them. You're going to take them down with you. You know, yep. nobody nobody wants that. But dude, no, very man. great conversation. And hopefully we can hang out soon, dude. Hopefully this whole shit clears okay. up now that we're living. I'm living in L.A. up by uh, La Brea now. And, you know, I, I'm actually walking distance one block away from the El Rey. Which oh, pisses wow. me. It pisses me off because this is the closest I have ever lived to a venue. Like I could walk to a show if I wanted to, and everything's closed. <laughs> yeah, but, man. That's. Uh, but hey, man. When once things get up and going, man, you'll be in a way better place just to walk to shows because that parking around that area kind of sucks. Yeah, yeah. I have my own private parking with this building, so I'm stoked. But that's but awesome. yeah, man. Hopefully things clear up and we get to hang out again, and uh, you yeah. know we'll be we'll be in touch. We, we text back and forth. Yeah. Fuck yeah. All right, man. Be safe. Have fun. Later. Later. Peace.